Today is the Sunday in which we celebrate the ancestors or forefathers of Christ. And so we heard in the genealogy all of these great ancestors that hopefully bring to our memory very important episodes in salvation history. Tragically today, these names fall on deaf ears. We don't know the great figures of salvation history, and so this genealogy really means nothing to us. Matthew began by telling us that this is the genealogy of Jesus the Christ. What does it mean, Jesus? The name Jesus is from the Hebrew, Yehoshua. Yehoshua means Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. This is the first time we hear this name is in the Old Testament. When the people had come out of Egypt and Moses went up on the mountain, this is before they got to Sinai, and the Amalekites came and attacked Israel that had just come out of Egypt. And as they were trying to fight out the Amalekites, Joshua began to lead the battle. This man, who eventually became known as Joshua. The people called him Hoshea, that is, Savior. But Moses said, no, 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 no. He is not to be called Hoshea, Savior, but Yahushua, that is, Yahweh is Savior. Yahweh saves. Through this man, he will save you from the Amalekites that are trying to kill you. And then as you know, when they go into the Promised Land, Moses does not go in, for various reasons we can't get into right now. Joshua takes over and leads the people into the Promised Land where Moses could not take them. And he begins that ministry of taking over where Moses left off at the Jordan River. This is where we're going to see the new Joshua begin his ministry at the Jordan River for that very same reason. We'll talk more about that when we celebrate his baptism in the great feast of Theophany, which is coming. Matthew then tells us that he is Jesus who is the Christ. The Christ is not his last name. This is a title from the Old Testament for the kings of Israel. In the Old Testament, when the people asked for a human king, they already had a king, the divine king, God, they asked for a human king to be like all the nations. And I said, okay, you want to be like the nations, I'll give you a king like the nations. So he brings them Saul. And Samuel the prophet pours olive oil all over his head. That's the anointing. As an outward visible sign of the inward dwelling of the Holy Spirit. So that sounds kind of sacramental. Oh yeah. New Testament didn't come out of anywhere. You know, nowhere. The, the, what we see in the Old Testament prefigures what we have in the New. And so God used olive oil to be that outward visible sign of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why was Saul going to need God's Spirit? Well, because Saul's going to now have to walk in the ways of the king, that is God, and lead the people, fight their, their battles for them, and save them from their enemies. Their enemies are going to try and kill them. And so, that's the job of the king. That's the job of God as the king of Israel. That was the job of a king in the ancient world. To save them from their enemies round about and rule over them. Now you know what happened to Saul. Three strikes and he was out. He didn't work out too well because he was not a king after the Lord's heart, but rather a king after the people's heart that is like the nations. And so after they were done with Saul, they had enough of that, God said, okay, now, now let me show you a king who is in my image, who is after my own heart. And he gives them David. And Samuel goes and anoints the, the head of David. This is recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And the Spirit descends upon David. And David is now the new anointed one, the Christ in Hebrew, Hamashiach, the Messiah, or Christos in Greek, the Christ. So the word Christ in the New Testament is not a, a, a last name for Jesus. It's a title from the Old Testament. You know that the Jews were waiting for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Christ. Why is that? Well, they were waiting for the return of the Christ. Not just the coming, but His coming back. Ever since the Babylonian exile, the anointed kings in the line of David, that is the, the Christ, the Messiah, had disappeared. They had not had an anointed king ruling over them for about 500 years. 
The temple was destroyed. The glory cloud disappeared. And so 500 years later, the people are still waiting for the return of two kings to Jerusalem. They've rebuilt the temple. They've rebuilt the city, just like the prophets said would happen. But there's a problem. Where is the Messiah, the earthly king, and where is the heavenly king? They were waiting for David, the son of David, to return to the Davidic house, the palace, right next door to God's palace. Heikel in Hebrew, it's palace, temple, it's the same word. They were expecting the, the glory cloud, God, the divine king, would also return to his palace. And then when that happened, everything would be restored and be a glorious king like the time of Solomon again. And Matthew tells us Jesus, who is the Savior, through whom God will be saving his people, who is the long-awaited Messiah, has come. He is the son of David, and everyone knew that. He had to be son of David. And this is an important contrast from the next chapter when we hear about a non-son of David who is king, Herod. More on that later. Jesus, the true king, son of David, fulfilling the promises of the Old Testament, is also son of Abraham, Matthew tells us. Now, what son of David is not a son of Abraham? There are none. It's a little redundant, isn't it, Matthew? Well, Matthew's not being redundant. He's trying to remind us of something very important. The reason why there is a long-awaited Messiah is because they had a king from before. The reason why they had a king from before is because God had called these people from Egypt. And God had called these people from Egypt who were the sons of Abraham. And Abraham was called so that through his seed all the nations should be blessed. And so Matthew reminds us just here, right in the beginning of the Gospel, that Jesus has not come simply to be king of the Jews, to reestablish some sort of earthly kingdom so that people can beat up their enemies like at the time of Solomon. No, the purpose of the coming of Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, is the restoration to the original purpose of having a king, the original purpose of the call of Israel, the original purpose of the call of Abraham, their great forefather, from among the nations. So that from, for the nations from which he was called, he might have a descendancy. And through that descendancy, all the nations someday would be blessed. All the nations, the Gentiles, would come into the people of God. This is why Matthew for, concludes his gospel by telling us that Jesus ordered his disciples to go out and baptize all nations. Jesus is that long-awaited son of David and son of Abraham. Now, how many people do you think in salvation history were sons of David and sons of Abraham? An awful lot. Thousands and thousands of sons of David. We heard, just about, we heard about a number of them just now. So he tells us from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and Judah and all the way down to David, the king. And then he tells us from David, the king, all the way down to Babylon exile. And then from Babylon exile all the way to the coming of the Christ. And he says there were 14 generations, 14 generations, 14, why 14? Sometimes people think of seven, well, that's God's lucky number, so two times seven must be really lucky. Well, that's not what's going on. Seven is not God's lucky number. Seven is the number of covenant in the Old Testament. It's a play off the Hebrew word sheva, seven, and shava, to swear, to join yourself in a covenant. So, but he doesn't divide this into sevens, into 14. And this is because of the numerical value of David's name was 14. In that ancient world, they counted and wrote with the same symbol, the Phoenician alphabet. Even in English today, we actually count and write with the Phoenician alphabet, just two different dialects of it. We use the Arabic form of the Phoenician alphabet to do our counting, and the Latin through the Greek form of the Phoenician alphabet to do our writing. But in the ancient world in this time, they wrote, they did math problems, and they wrote paragraphs with the same system. And so, when you were looking at a couple of things on a, on a, on a piece of wood, or on a piece of paper, or on a, on a pillar, you had to look at it and see, is this a math problem? Is this a date? Or is this someone's name? Or is this a sentence? And by looking at it, they could quickly discern what they were looking at. David's name, Dawid, Dalit, Vav Dalit adds up to 14. And so he's showing us that 14, 14, 14, this is the, the perfect generation. Three is perfection in the Bible. The perfect generation for the fulfillment of not only 
the promise to David that his son would come and rule over God's people, but also the promise all the way back to Abraham, who was promised that through his seed, his descendancy, his own son, all the nations someday would be blessed. But there are how many people do you think in the first century in Bethlehem and Nazareth and around could fulfill that genealogy? Well, thousands of boys who could count back 14 to David, 14 to... Easy. So what he shows us is this is a unique generation in which all the promises to David and Abraham would be fulfilled. But he also tells us that the descendancy of Jesus from Joseph was different from Joseph from his father. He doesn't say Joseph begot Jesus. He says Joseph was the husband of Mary of whom Jesus, who was the Christ, was to be born. And so now he shows us that among that unique generation of children, sons of David, living in Bethlehem in Nazareth at the time, there was one boy who was unique among them all. Because he was born by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mary, who was a temple virgin, as you know from the early stories, Mary was a temple virgin. She had been dedicated to the temple by Joachim and Anna, her parents, in their old age, so that someone would take care of her when Joachim and Anna were long gone. By the time she was a teenager, by the time it would be time to marry her off, Joachim and Anna would have been dead. They were very old when they conceived her. So they gave her to the temple as a temple virgin, just like Samuel was dedicated to the temple in the Old Testament. Others were at this time. We celebrate the feast of the presentation of the Virgin Mary. That's a remnant of that original tradition. When Mary became 12, 13, when these girls became to the age of womanhood, they would marry them off to an older man in the community who could watch over them and respect their vow of virginity to the temple. They typically chose a widower, an older man in the community, and Joseph was that widower. He was an older man. His wife had died. His, his boys were, had, were older now. And he was chosen through a miraculous sign to be the man who would take this particular temple virgin into his home and care for her. This happened through the sprouting of his staff with almond blossoms. This is why you find an ancient statuary in the West, iconography in the East. Joseph is always shown with a staff with white flowers coming out. Because a sign was given to them at that time that Joseph was the one to take care of this Mary. It's a sign already of what was to come that we're talking about now and for the next couple of days. And that is that Mary would become the Ark of the New Covenant because in her womb would dwell the Word of God in the flesh. And so Joseph has a blossoming staff just like Aaron was chosen to be the priest of the sanctuary in the Old Testament. Joseph is shown to be the priest taking care of the new sanctuary where God would dwell among men. You still see remnants of this artist will put white flowers in Joseph's hand. Well, that's a remnant. Artists had no idea what they're doing anymore, but it's a remnant back to that original story. And so when he finds that she is pregnant, there's a problem. She's a temple virgin and nothing was supposed to be happening. And now she's pregnant and so she does, he doesn't know what to do. He realizes a problem in the, in the Old Testament. A man could have multiple wives, but a woman couldn't have multiple husbands. Joseph keeps the law perfectly. And if this woman has now been has conceived by the power of God, then God is her husband. And so Joseph, knowing the law, he's a righteous man, it says, dikaios in the Greek, he wants to separate from her in order to keep the law perfectly. And the angel says, no, 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 Joseph. Don't go anywhere. You can't leave. Because you are son of David, Joseph. Joseph, son of David, this has happened by the power of the Holy Spirit and you must stay here and name that boy because by naming the boy who will be born you will be adopting him into the line of David and by adopting the line of David he will fulfill the promises to David and to Abraham so that he might be the one who would rule over his people and save them from their enemies round about but Matthew shows us the enemies that Jesus will save them from is not the Philistines or the Amalekites who want to kill them, but rather sin, because sin is what leads to spiritual death. And so Jesus will come and save them from their sins, he says. And so Joseph names the boy Jesus when he is born. We celebrate as we hear in the epistle to the Hebrews and in this long story
all of these great individuals in salvation history who led up to this great, unique moment in the history of the universe. The ancestors of Christ, the forefathers of Christ. These individuals all throughout salvation history passed on the faith to the next generation so that in the next generation God would raise up special individuals to continue that story. And so we have to ask ourselves today on, on the day when we celebrate all of the individuals, men and women, who went before the moment of the birth of Christ all the way back to Joseph and Mary, Joachim and Anna, all the way back to Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah, back to the time of Solomon and David, back to the time of Abraham, all the way back to Noah and back to Adam. Are we today in our families, in our households, doing what these generations did? Are we like Abraham or like Isaac or are we like Zerubbabel or Nehemiah passing on the faith to our children? Do our children know who Zerubbabel was? Do our children know who Ezra was or Nehemiah? Do our children know who came first, Gideon or David? Do our children know who came first, Isaiah? Or Samuel. Because if our children don't know the basic characters of the story of the ancestors of Christ, there is no possible way they're going to be able to pass on the faith that you have right now in your heart, that got you here this morning, that got you up in the morning, that got you in your car, that got you driving on the freeway all the way here and got you to the moment where you would stand here and worship the Lord for a few hours. Where did that faith come from? It came from your parents. It came from the previous generation who passed on the faith that they had received from their parents to you. You have the faith in your heart right now because your parents passed that on to you. And so we have to ask ourselves, am I doing that for the next generation? We have horrible stories in salvation history where that system broke down. When the people went into the Promised Land, Joshua continued to exhort them to keep the faith and to worship the one true God. But then the book of Judges tells us of a tragedy in chapter 2. That eventually Joshua died. And all that generation who had known the works of the Lord and had continued to be faithful to the Lord they also died. Why were they faithful to the Lord? To the God of Abraham? It says because they knew what He had done for them and therefore they trusted in Him now and for the future. But a moment came when Joshua and that whole generation who had seen all the mighty works of the Lord and who had known what God had done for them and therefore had strong faith resting on that reason, that generation all eventually died. And the book of Judges tells us in chapter 2 that when the next generation arose, they did not know the Lord nor the works which He had done. Now, if you know Scripture, you know what's going to happen next, right? They did not know what the Lord had done and so therefore they did not have faith in the Lord. And so we find in the next verse that they turned to the idolatry of the land and began to worship the gods of the nations. And then we have the rest of the tragic story of the book of Judges. Don't let that happen in this generation. Don't let that happen in your family. And they say, well, Father, I, I understand what you're saying. It's a little late. My kids went to public school and they lost the faith there. Or, well, I didn't do what I should have done when they were young. Or, or maybe I, I haven't been doing, with those who have young kids, I haven't been doing what I should have been doing up to this point. Today is the moment of salvation. Salvation begins now. Today, the virgin is on her way to the cave where she will give birth. Tomorrow we will sing on Christmas Eve, 
Today, the virgin gives birth in the cave. Today, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Today, we have the opportunity of salvation because today, at every second in our life, we have the opportunity to repent of our, our sin and our failures, which we all have. Lord, I am sorry that I have not done what You have asked me to do. But I say today, through Your grace, I will do something different from now, for, now and forward. There are great saints in salvation history who were not raised in the faith. But late in life came to know the Lord. There is, it is never too late to pray for your children and to speak to your children, whether they are young or old, about Jesus and what He has done and what God has done in salvation history for His people and for you in your own life. We must share with our children the salvation history of God's people. From Adam to Noah to Abraham to the coming of the Christ until today. And we must share with our children what God has done in our own lives, our own salvation history story. We all have events in our life where God has saved us from the pit. Many of you today, if I asked right now, tell me of a miracle in your life, and you could stand up right now and tell us of a real, authentic miracle. I've seen them, I've experienced them. Are we passing these stories on to our children? Not only when God parted the waters of the Red Sea, but also when God parted the waters of the Red Sea of our own life in some stage when we were facing a major crisis and God intervened and saved us. We must pass those stories on to our children so that our children will grow up like us, like our parents raised us, and be Jephthah and Gideon and Samson and David and Barak and Nehemiah and Ezra, Solomon, all of these great figures of salvation history. So the faith will continue until Christ comes again. To Him be glory with His eternal Father, His all holy good and life, giving spirit both now and ever and unto age of ages. Amen.